uh, I think, uh, you know, we still want to hear uh, Natalie Müller because it fits so nicely and I'm sure we get another exciting, uh, exciting, uh, exciting insight into uh, understanding the North American lost crops, which is really a hot new topic, I understand. I will just say a few words uh, about, uh, is, it, is it not? <laughs> yeah, okay. That's what I thought, but I'm, I'm not an archaeologist, so I don't know. So clearly you are an archaeologist and uh, you study the origins of agriculture and uh, you're integrating, as I'm sure your talk will show, morphometric, molecular and experimental data. And uh, you, under, you have uh, uh, both, under, uh, both uh, studied the evolution of uh, domesticated plants, but in connection also with the uh, development of agrobiodiversity throughout the Holocene. So you guys also always combine the large deep temporal perspective with uh, detailed data analysis. And so I'm uh, very much looking uh, forward to your talk and what it will tell us about food, food security and uh, you know, Anthropocene beginnings. Okay, thanks. Um, I'm excited today to talk about a new project that I'm doing with um, with Dr. Robert Spengler, uh, which he referenced at the beginning for the first time. Um, but I'll introduce kind of what, I'm, what I've been doing in general on the lost crops before I get into the specifics of that project. Um, so it sort of is a hot, it's, it's a hot new again topic. It's, not, uh, it's something that we've known about as archeologists in Eastern North America for a long time, um, since the work that was pioneering work that was done in the 1960s. Um, we have a timeline up here at the uh, top of sort of um, North American deep history. Um, with the crops that came into the system approximately, you know, lined up on that chronology. So what you can see here is that the crops that you probably associate with Native American cuisine, and rightly so, um, maize, beans, and squashes like pumpkins, uh, entered this part of the country pretty late. They were domesticated in Mexico, and they reached this, this area through trade. Um, and indigenous people in this part of the world did play a huge, hugely important role in adapting these crops to North American climates and creating all these diverse land races. Um, but for, for thousands of years before that, uh, these indigenous seed crops were cultivated in this part of the world. And of the crops that were cultivated by ancient people here, only two of them have survived into the modern era. So we have sunflowers and uh, native varieties of squashes like acorn squash that are from eastern North America. So these other uh, five species are the lost crops, which have been the focus of my research um, for the past several years. And this is, I'm not going to go too much into detail about them, but if you're curious about any of them specifically, I could talk about them literally forever. Um, so I just want to kind of explain how we know that they're lost crops, because I find that sometimes people are, uh, you know, their initial reaction is skepticism, that uh, five important crops could have simply vanished um, from use. So one way we know is from uh, context, archaeological context like this one. This is from a site very close to here, up on the bluffs above the American Bottom floodplain. Um, it's, this deposit um, is a, uh, dates to about 900 AD. And what it is is it's a homogenous layer of um, knotweed, erect knotweed seeds, uh, numbering in the many millions, um, that was at the bottom of a storage pit. Um, so this is not the kind of thing that we would expect to find if plants are just sort of being incidentally used by people. It's uh, clear evidence for an archaeologist of um, seed storage and, and that the seeds were being um, consumed. We have even more unambiguous evidence. I actually finally got to see this, uh, my favorite of all artifacts, uh, last week. It was really exciting. This is a bag that's full of the seeds of domesticated goosefoot, so a really close relative of quinoa. Um, and this was found in one of the dry rock shelters in the Ozarks Mountains in Arkansas. And likewise, we have things like this bundle of grass. This is also from Arkansas. Um, that looks like it could have been collected, you know, last year, but it's uh, actually, I think, about 2,000 years old. I'm not sure how old exactly this specimen is. We have evidence from um, the Ozarks Mountains and from the Appalachian Mountains for seed storage in caves and rock shelters. And then uh, the reason, part of the reason that uh, Gal and I were laughing about it being a hot new topic is because some of this key research that convinced people that the lost crops were in fact lost crops was really done quite a long time ago. And one of the key pieces of research was done by one of our distinguished um, professors at Washington University, Patty Jo Watson, who did cave archaeology. And she worked in uh, Mammoth Cave National Park and other places. And one of the many wonderful things that we found in these caves uh, were human feces, uh, paleofeces. 
And uh, these human paleo feces are full of the seeds of these lost crops. So hopefully if you weren't convinced that people are eating the seeds before, uh, the paleo feces will convince you as it did many archaeologists back in the uh, late 1970s. And I actually just saw uh, one of these paleo feces for the first time too last week, and it was amazing. I wish I had put a picture and it was full of maygrass seeds, um, something only an archaeologist could love. Uh, <laughs> So um, my, my project for the past two years, it's a, um, a postdoctoral fellowship that I'm doing at Cornell. It's funded by the National Science Foundation and the Smithsonian. Um, and it has a lot of different aspects to it. So I unfortunately don't have any time to talk about these two aspects at all. But if you're interested, just come up and talk to me afterwards. What I'm really going to be focusing on is um, what we've been calling the survey for lost crops, which is documenting where these plants occur on the landscapes or what their natural ecology is. Um, and some issues that we've been having due to the huge um, anthropogenic changes that have been wrought in my study area, um, in particular in the past 500 years or so. So this is the, the area where I work. Obviously, it's centered on the Mississippi River. Um, and this is an area, if you're from here, that you know has been really, you know, it's, it's industrial. It's mostly used for industrial agriculture, but even the parts that aren't used for industrial agriculture are used for industrial timber production or for industries, maybe we usually think about it, things like factories, refineries, and things like that. Um, there are very few parts of this, of this study area where you can see anything similar to what, what, what the landscape would have looked like a thousand years ago. Um, and even in places where it sort of looks like, oh, this is a prairie remnant or something like that, it's not actually, you know, a, a, a continu continuation of the ecosystem that was there before. It was at some point cleared or farmed and has been restored um, by people with a variety of different ideas about what restoration means. Um, and so one thing that, that I've been trying to think more about is how we can kind of peel back the layers of changes that have occurred in this landscape to try and understand what, what foragers would have seen uh, 4,000 years ago, or what agriculturists would have seen 1,000 years ago. <clears throat> um, this is tricky. Okay, so this is uh, the Survey for Lost Crops. This has taken place over a couple of, of years and involved, uh, you know, about three months of field work at this point. Um, and basically what I do is I go and collect information about where these species have, a sort, uh, have historically occurred, which is um, uh, stored in herbarium specimens, some of which go back, you know, 300 years or so in this region, the earliest ones. Um, and then there's things like this that have made that, that information really easy to access. This is the Global uh, Biodiversity Information Facility, um, where a lot of this information from herbarium specimens has been digitized so that you can just download it without having to actually go and write it down yourself. And then, you know, asking local people and, and knowledgeable people in particular where I can find these plants, people like Gail in this very room and other colleagues who have been studying these plants for a long time. So um, in doing this, I've encountered these plants um, in a lot of different kinds of situations. And uh, in particular, at first, my research was focused on um, this, this uh, you're getting like little sneak peeks of what's to come, uh, <laughs> the floodplain hypothesis, which has been around for a long time and has been very influential for people who study the origins of agriculture in this part of the world. And basically what the hypothesis is, is that in these areas that are scoured by floods, what you have is basically like a natural uh, field situation. Like without actually clearing land, without uh, expending energy to burn or um, to clear land by, by hand, you have clearings where that could have been sort of like the first fields where people would have encountered these plants um, in dense homogenous stands that they could have then started to cultivate. And so I've been very focused on looking for them near rivers. Um, so I, and that's also a good place to find, um, you know, sort of annual weedy plants in general, uh, which is probably part of the reason why these plants um, were attractive to humans, because uh, annual weedy plants tend to produce a lot of seeds that people can eat. So you do, in fact, find these plants in floodplains. Um, this is just up the river by Chain of Rocks Bridge. There was a bunch of ketopodium up there, some of which was the right species, most of which wasn't. Ketopodium is a nightmare. And then... Um, <laughs> There's this population of Ivo, which was growing also on the Mississippi River. And I just picked Mississippi River examples because we're talking about the Mississippi River. But you can find these plants growing on all of the rivers that were in that map that I just showed you. So it's, it's certainly true that these plants can be dis dispersed by floods. They can be dispersed by water. And they can grow in floodplains. And that may have been one of the places where ancient people encountered them, as uh, archaeologists have hypothesized for a long time. Uh, but another really important thing to consider about this area where these plants were domesticated is that um, much of it was actually covered in tall grass prairie. Um, so we usually think of tall grass prairie as being, you know, out west. Um, but in fact, there was this thing called the Prairie Peninsula, which was a tall grass prairie. And this is sort of, it's an old map, so it's hard to see. But this is Illinois. You can kind of see the outline of Illinois. Well, those of us that are from the U.S. and are familiar with U.S. states can. Anyway, there's like the bottom of Lake Michigan. 
Um, so the Prairie Peninsula was, was a, a, occupied a huge area east of the Mississippi River. Um, and a question that I have, uh, that I've had for a long time is, would these, would these plants have occurred in the prairie at all? Um, how could portions of the prairie have been cleared by people that didn't have plows in order to cultivate these plants? And what's the deal with the Prairie Peninsula? Um, so one, another thing that I've learned from, uh, not just from foraging for these plants, but also from cultivating them myself, is that for many of them, the only way to really make it worthwhile to go out and collect seeds is when you find a dense homogenous stand like this. So this is Maygrass. Um, this is the only population of Maygrass that we found that was like this. That was like a field that you could just walk around and, and harvest mangrass seeds. Um, and it was occurring in a really like clearly anthropogenic environment, like right on, right between like a drainage ditch and, you know, a GMO cornfield in uh, Arkansas. So the question that I had seeing this population is where would something like this have occurred before we had these kinds of industrial agricultural landscapes for them to grow in? Like where would they have occurred before uh, agriculture in order to allow agriculture to begin? Um, because when you find maygrass and prairie remnants, so pieces of a prairie that have been preserved or restored, uh, they don't look like that. There's like, that, that's one maygrass plant, right? And, and if you're going to go and try and gather seeds um, from populations like this, it's really pretty futile unless you're like a bird or something. So, um, the, so then, you know, I started to think about, well, okay, well, what, are, what do these prairies actually represent? Are they anything like the ancient prairies? And around the same time, Rob and I started working on... Um, this project about seed dispersal, which he talked about um, at great length. And I started, uh, you know, at first he said, oh, do you want to, you know, talk about how seed dispersal could have been involved in plant domestication around the world? And I was like, yeah, okay. And he was like, well, you look into how it could have played out in Eastern North America. And my first reaction was it had nothing to do with it. Like, we didn't have any domesticated animals in this part of the world that could have played a role. Um, but then I started to read about the bison and the, the prairie remnants where they potentially could have lived. And realize that the bison affect particularly the tall grass prairie in really uh, important ways. And we're just starting to kind of have an even basic understanding of this because the bison were almost driven to extinction. And they've only been reintroduced on tall grass prairies in the past like 30 years or so because there's fewer tall grass prairies remaining and they're further east. So it took longer to reintroduce the bison in those ecosystems than in the short grass prairie. But what's happening is they do reintroduce them as they're seeing that the clearest effect that the bison have. What's the next slide? No. Clearest effect that the bison have on the prairie is to um, make it more heterogeneous. So it's dominated by perennial grasses. What the bison do is create disturbance, um, and then you get annual plants, and you get non-grasses, what are called forbs, which are most of the lost crops. So things like uh, goosefoot, um, uh, knotweed, and um, iva annua, three of the lost crops. <clears throat> so the bison are affecting uh, the prairie in these characteristic ways. They're also dispersing the seeds of some of these species. So ecologists, all unknowing of the lost crops, have documented the um, seeds of some of the ancient, you know, the crop progenitors in the dung and in the fur of bi uh, bison. So we know that they are seed dispersers for these species. Um, and also, there's been recent research um, on bison in the east that has kind of changed some of the conventional wisdom. So if there's archaeologists that work in eastern North America in the room, they're probably, like, biting their tongues right now, like, oh, but there weren't any bison in this prairie peninsula east of the Mississippi River. But... Um, recent research has kind of called that into question. So we've always known that historically, in the, from the 1500s on, there were a lot of bison east of the Mississippi River because people were hunting them. And uh, we have tons of historical records and hilarious little drawings like this um, from early journals and things like that about how important bison hunting was east of the Mississippi River. And, of course, we have place names as far east as the East Coast um, that were named for the, for the buffalo and bison that live there. <clears throat> but it's always been thought that for whatever reason... Um, before 1500, there weren't bison east of the Mississippi River. And the reason why people thought that is because there weren't a lot of them showing up in archaeological sites. But recently, there's been this, this uh, volume came out um, reassessing the presence of uh, bison in archaeological sites in Illinois in particular. And I've just pointed out a couple key things here. So these green, um, these green marks here are kind of marking um, these two different sites. So the Titterington, do I have any? More, I should have more stuff here. So the first one is a thing we call the Titterington Complex, which is the appearance of a, a lot of um, uh, early crops in the Illinois River Valley. And the second one is Riverton, which is a site where you have multiple domesticated different crops appearing together for the first time, so the formation of a crop complex. Um, sort of bracketing where we have the first good solid dates for bison um, in Illinois. 
Uh, and then later on, we've got these, this, these, this one site that has these two different bison skeletons that actually have um, projectile points embedded in them, so direct evidence for people hunting bison you know, thousands of years ago in Illinois. So this kind of evidence is calling into question uh, the assumption that bison weren't playing a role in the ecology and in the cultures of people in east of the Mississippi River in ancient times. <clears throat> Um, and this is just kind of some of the stuff that's coming out of the ecology, so more circumstantial evidence that this hypothesis might have something to it. Um, the effects of bison grazing on forb density, so non-grass, annual grasses on the prairie, uh, is, is significant where it's been studied. And um, the, the fact that many seeds, these were not the species that we're interested in, but um, similar types of seeds, can survive digestion through a bison's uh, digestive system and then be viable afterwards, so they can be dispersed by bison. So we're going to continue um, this, these lines of research, but focus specifically on these species that were crop progenitors. So go out onto the prairie and look and see if um, bison grazing is leading to concentrations of crop progenitors, and also feed the seeds of the lost crops of the bison, go out and collect their dung, and see what germinates from it. Which when I explained this to my father, he was like, did you lose a bet? Why are you doing this? <laughs> <laughs> So, but I think it's going to be fun, and I've never had an opportunity to do anything, uh, research involving animals before, so I'm really looking forward to it. Um, so that's the, how this project fits into um, the larger Anthropocene Mississippi project, yeah. So, thank you. Thank you.